Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be an acceptable offering in your sight. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture from Exodus is a lectionary reading for today. If you choose to spend some time reading the Bible and go to chapter 32 and read some before and some after today's assigned reading, you will be immersed in the drama of Moses trying to get the people to behave. My study Bible calls this account the Great Rebellion. People who had eaten manna for breakfast, who had just solemnly agreed to keep every word of the covenant, who were at that moment standing beside a mountain stormy with the Lord's presence, those very people at Aaron's behest proceeded to melt down their gold jewelry and flagrantly flout the first commandment by worshiping the golden calf. Stiff-necked, God called the Israelites as he burned in anger at their intransigence. Only the eloquence of the appeal for mercy from the leader Moses allowed them to escape God's punishment. We can understand that the people were tired of living in the desert, but on the other hand, they had been eager to escape the life they endured in Egypt. Breaking the commandments of God was no way to act, and only because of Moses did they escape. My study Bible states that the bright hope of Exodus 20, when the covenant with the Ten Commandments was made, died forever in Exodus 32. For 40 days, Moses visited with God on Mount Sinai, receiving the terms of the agreement that would allow an unprecedented closeness between God and human beings. What happened down below, at the foot of the mountain, almost defies belief. There is no more jarring contrast in the entire Bible." End quote. That's a provocative statement. But if one considers how the people apparently so quickly forgot all about God, then we can see that their behavior at handing over their gold jewelry and then dancing around a created idol does represent scandalous behavior that led God to threaten to destroy them. This excerpt from the scripture indicates that even when given a clearly defined better choice, often people then and now opt for the wrong choice. Unfortunately, wisdom does not come easily to the human race. Failure to remain true to God led to their downfall and they paid for their acts by wandering 40 years in a desolate wilderness. But in spite of the actions of those long ago Israelites, I do have sympathy for them. I want to share a story of my connection with the area we are considering. In 1963, I decided that since I had earned money teaching high school, I was going to use some of it for, for traveling. After a summer for French at McGill University, I flew to Europe and visited Britain. I, I visited Paris on the way to visiting my German pen pal, and then took a cruise in the Mediterranean with my Canadian friends, Lynn Shirtliff from Starbuck and Shirley Matchett from Treherne. We were three decks down, way down, in the ship and we were beside the boilers, but we took that as one of the necessities of traveling on a somewhat limited budget. In Lebanon, our port stop gave us the choice of going to Baalbek or Damascus. Lynn and Shirley chose the ruins of the ancient city of Heliopolis, Heliopolis at Baalbek, but I was determined to go where the Apostle Paul had gone. The trip to Damascus was terrifying because the bus driver tended to rely on honking his horn rather than using defensive driving skills. There were no guardrails on the steep, steep passes, and I was quickly aware 
of the small value attached to human life. The driver honked the horn, and for him, that ended his responsibility. Other drivers or pedestrians simply had to get out of the way. In spite of the danger inherent in riding the bus, I was emotionally moved when we stopped and the driver pointed out Mount Hermon. This was the mountain that God saw, that Moses saw after God commanded him to ascend Mount Nebo so that he could visit, view the promised land. It was a pivotal moment for me which made the long journey of the Israelites as they sought to enter the promised land very real, especially because we had been driving over that rugged terrain. They had traveled on foot. I was on a bus. The contrast made me realize how much the Israelites had to endure in their long trek. Or, and for that reason, I can feel sorry for them. We moved to the New Testament reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's a short book, only four chapters, yet it has an influence that goes beyond what, what one might expect. Paul, Paul used the word joy or rejoice every few paragraphs. And the epistle gives us a picture of Paul's ability to give credit to teamwork with Jesus as the basis of his joy. This is in spite of the fact that the letter was written while Paul was chained to a Roman guard. Many scholars believe that Paul wrote Philippians, the book, in Rome just about the time Nero began sending Christians to the Colosseum to face lions. Nevertheless, Paul found strength to encourage the Philippians not to worry and to present their needs to God in prayer. Today's passage makes it clear that Paul was very aware of the vagaries of human nature. He returns to the issue of conflict or dissension within the Philippian church, an issue he, he had addressed in an earlier chapter. The actual cause of the problem is not stated, <clears throat> but knowing people, it seems reasonable to assume that ego, power plays, personal authority were at least part of the problem. As a result, Paul went so far as to name Sintish and Eudoria and to plead with them to work towards the virtues he then stated. And listen to this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul made an appeal to their better selves, to the virtues which can reside in everyone. It is as if he said, let these virtues and my own example be your guide. If you do these things, Paul says, the God of peace will be with you. The congregation at Philippi had become his favorite church, and the happy tone of the letter and his concluding thank you to his loyal friends gives us an encouraging picture of what faithful followers of Jesus can be and do. That little book in the Bible can give inspiration to all of us. To pick up on the thought of inspiration, we can give some attention to the official name for today, the first Sunday after Thanksgiving. Today marks World Food Day, which was established for the third Sunday in October by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization on October 16, 1945. The goal, the goal is to free humanity from hunger and malnutrition and to manage effectively the global food system. World Food Days are events are organized in over 150 countries 
making it one of the most celebrated days in the United Nations calendar. These events are designed to promote worldwide awareness and action to help strengthen the link between agriculture and food security. Canadian Food Grains Bank is a partnership of 15 Canadian churches and church-based agencies working together to end world hunger by providing emergency food in times of crisis, helping people improve their access to food in the longer term, and engaging Canadians and governments towards meaningful service and work in this respect. The United Church is one of the partners, and when you donate, you can indicate your affiliation. They put out a, a little report every few months, and the stories related are so inspiring and uplifting. You are given hope that the goals someday will be met. The old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, is so true when you see the joy on the faces of people who have been give, able to turn their lives around after having been given food or agricultural training or skills that enable them to earn income and provide food for their families. So I'm going to show you some, can you see that, the joy on that face? It's just wonderful. This lady has completed a, a sewing course, and now she is able to earn money uh, with her new skills. So there's a, a picture of a, of a happy person. And there's another issue here, more happiness and more happiness. And then I'm going to read what they say in one place. In many ways, this past year has been defined by the crises. That's plural. We have re witnessed unfolding around the world. From the ongoing drought in the Horn of Africa to natural disasters such as the earthquake in Turkey and Syria and the disruptions to food systems caused by violent conflicts such as the ones in Ukraine and Sudan, it's fe it feels as though 2022-23 has been one crisis after another. And then we let add to that the current crisis in Palestine, Israel, Gaza. But the hope, but we also believe it has been defined by the resilience of the people we serve, the dedication of loyal partners, and the incredible support we continue to receive from Canadians like you who have joined us in this mission of ending hunger. Inside this issue of Breaking Bread, you see the work accomplished in our last fiscal year. In the past year, our members and partners committed to serving more than 1 million people in 36 countries with humanitarian food assistance and long-term development programming. And it's just thrilling to read of the success that has been made one step at a time. And they, they give a map of where that aid has been given. And it, it does make you feel I am proud that we are able and given the opportunity to share. And if you, I, I have brought along this extra copy. If, if anyone wishes to receive, to have this, take these home, see me afterwards. Um, and the address for contacting the Canadian Food Grains Bank is on your little service leaflet as well. And uh, if you notice, they list the different churches that are affiliated. And the United Church of Canada is alphabetically towards the bottom of the list. But we can check off and say that we support through our 
affiliation with the United Church. So there's a lot of people in Canada working towards food security in whatever way can be, it can be accomplished. We in Canada are fortunate to have the federal government support this endeavor, and no doubt you have seen fields where the focus sign indicates that the crop yield is to be donated to Canadian Food Grains Bank. Now, honestly, someone might say that the whole concept has been a failure since we have not eradicated hunger. My feeling is that the faithfulness that so many have indicated and put into action is a sign that we are trying to live up to and live out our commitment to serving others. The golden rule is not defunct. It is alive and well and though in those who follow the example of Jesus and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. May we be given the strength and generosity of spirit to go forward and live in the Jesus way. Amen. <laughs>